Colleagues, friends, students, good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this Vice Chancellor's Open Lecture, which the University of Cape Town is delivering online. The Vice Chancellor's Open Lectures are designed to provide an opportunity for anyone, whether or not they're connected to UCT, to hear firsthand from people who have distinguished themselves in their respective areas of expertise people who inspire us to greatness. By hosting this platform online, we make it possible to include alumni and other friends of the UCT community across South Africa and the world while adhering to the responsible practice of social distancing. UCT has hosted a broad range of experts, including this evening's esteemed speaker, Ms. Sakani Maluleke, a proud UCT alumna and the first woman to hold the position of Auditor General of South Africa in the 109 year history of the Supreme Audit Institution. Since the onset of COVID-19, it has become more imperative that e than ever that we take every opportunity to connect with one another in a way, in any way we can. These discussions allow us to hear and consider different points of view, to instill a sense of inclusivity, transformation and excellence within the university community and to focus on areas where we can do better. Combining inclusivity, transformation and excellence is critical to securing the future of South Africa's democracy. Ms. Maluleke stands at the helm of one of the country's best examples of accountable leadership. World-class auditors in an office respected for its independence, credibility, and integrity. Such leadership is sorely needed in today's world. A panel of business, religious, academic, and civil society leaders co-hosted by, by the Business Day earlier this month warned that recent failures of leadership in, gov and in government are deterring foreign investment and pushing the country into, pre into a precarious socioeconomic position that is potentially harmful to all South Africans but especially those living in disadvantaged communities. But this problem is not unique to South Africa. Professor Judy Brown of the School of Accounting and Commercial Law at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand warns of a serious threat to democratic decision-making posed by what she refers to as the allure of numbers and scientific calculation, evident in technocratic approaches to leadership. She calls for open and transparent discussion to help stakeholders trust the information they receive. Respected Swedish investment advisor Dag Detta says modern accounting has the capacity to restore trust in governments and to address the growing global frustration over mismanagement of public assets, wasted resources and corruption. These are challenges with which Ms. Maruleke is all too familiar. She has said she wants the work of the audit office to reflect the lived experiences of all South Africans. She has the qualifications and experience to make it happen. She's a chartered accountant and auditor with a Bachelor of Commerce in Accounting degree from UCT, as well as postgraduate diplomas in accountancy from UCT and in development and public, public management from the University of the Witwatersrand. Rand. She has served on the Presidential Black Economic Empowerment Advisory Council, successfully leading the subcommittee that developed recommendations for broad-based Black economic empowerment. And as chairperson of the CA Charter Council, she led um, uh, um, she led the first BE sector, sector charter, focusing on key transformation initiatives. She has actively contributed to the advancement of black professionals in the accounting profession through her work with organizations such as the Business Unity South Africa, African Women Chartered Accountants, and the Association for, for the Advancement of Black Accountants of South Africa, Southern Africa of which she is a past president. Like so many other women leaders, Ms. Maluleke has had to work twice as hard 
for half of the credit as a black African woman in leadership. But this is the same woman who changed her course of study from law to accounting because someone told her that the scarcity of black people in the profession was because black people struggle with the board exam. I must say she proved that person wrong. Today, she will draw from her 20 year career in both the private and public sectors in areas including auditing, consulting, corporate advisory, development finance, investment management, and skills development to discuss the role of accountancy professionals in strengthening democracy. Sakani, we are so delighted that you've come back home to talk to us and share your experience with us. Welcome to UCT. Thank you very much for accepting our, in, our, our invitation. We look forward to hearing from you. The platform is yours. Thank you very much, uh, UCT Vice Chancellor and the facilitator of our dialogue today, Professor Mamukheti Paragain. Um, I was delighted to hear of your latest accolade with the university in the UK today. Sincere congratulations to you. Uh, I'd like to greet the UCT Chair of Council, Ms. Baba Longonyama, and the UCT Chancellor, Dr. Precious Muloi Muzebe. Uh, warm greetings to the UCT acad academic community, honored guests, students, administrative staff, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm humbled to be following in the footsteps of some of the global thought leaders that have participated in these dialogues. As we are all aware, we are in the middle of local government elections, a democratic imperative that must spring all of us to action, as our individual participation is an obligation that we must take seriously. Our democratic success is highly dependent on each of us actively participating as citizens and taking our civic duties seriously. With that in mind, it is a great privilege and honor for me to be able to speak to you tonight about two subjects that I hold very close to my heart, accountability and democracy. Our democracy can only flourish and fulfill the aspirations and dreams of those it is meant to serve, the people of South Africa, when it is backed and reinforced by accountability. As the Auditor General, I represent the Chapter 9 institution that is tasked with supporting our country's democracy through auditing public funds. Now, this puts a massive responsibility on my colleagues and I. And for us, we see this as a duty to meaningfully contribute towards building a capable state with capable institutions that are effective in fulfilling their given mandates in a transparent and accountable manner. These ideals, which are enshrined in our constitution and expressed in our development blueprint, the National Development Plan, require our best collective efforts as a nation. While those of us in the accountancy profession provide the necessary insights and checks and balances to enable accountability. Now I shall explore this as I go along. For now, allow me to turn my attention to the meaning of democracy itself. Like so many of the words that we use in everyday English, democracy is Greek in origin from demos for people and kratos meaning force or might. So democracy derives its strength from the might of the people. Even if in ancient Athens where the principle was first put into practice, the right to take part in civic affairs by casting a vote was not extended to women and slaves. Happily, we are a long way since then. But as Fernando Cardoso, the former president of Brazil, put it, democracy is not just a question of having a vote, as important as that is. In its true meaning, it consists of strengthening each citizen's possibility and capacity to participate in the deliberations involved in life and in society. Each citizen then, has an obligation to participate in free and fair elections, but more than that, it is their right, in fact, their duty to hold to account those that are elected or appointed to lead. Tonight, by the light 
that accountability and democracy shine on each other. I hope to illuminate the role that our old, our age old profession can play in strengthening the foundations of our society. And I hope to remind us too of the central truth that emerges from the rows and rows of numbers and the columns of dusty old ledgers or in the honeycomb-like cells of the digital spreadsheets that we use every day. The truth being that numbers, figures, and data are not just abstract signifiers on a balance sheet. They have a human face. They stand for the hopes and dreams of individuals, the prospect of a tomorrow in which their constitutionally protected rights to security, shelter, health care and education are everyday realities rather than distant ideals. They signify the extent to which individuals have the opportunity to realize their full potential. They stand for the health and wealth of nations. So let us remember then that when we talk about accounting, when we talk about democracy, that actually we're talking about people. First, let me take you back, back through the ages to the dawn of our species at the southern edge of this continent that we call home. Thousands of years ago in a place that we now call the cradle of humankind, our ancestors began turning thoughts into language, turning the rhythms of everyday life into music and chips of sharpened stone into arrowheads for, for hunting and scrapers for digging into the soil. The first rough tools that marked the start of our democracy and our journey as creatures of craft and technology. But even then, there was another instinct that was kindled into being when the first humans took stock of their surroundings. They looked into the horizon and gazed up at the infinity of the heavens. And this instinct to keep tally, to keep track, to add one thing to the next, to subtract one thing to the, from the other, in the quest to find order and meaning in the great calculus of life. Generations of accountancy students will be familiar with the name Luca Pacchioli. He was a Franciscan friar who was a master of mathematics and a close friend of Leonardo da Vinci in Italy during the Middle Ages. The main reason as accountants we remember Pacchioli is because of a book he wrote in which he introduced the world to a radical new invention that would forever change our understanding of the measure of money. He called it the double entry bookkeeping. Now, even in our age of computerized accounting, where we no longer rely on T-accounts, we still abide by the original principles and processes described in that very book. That means we have a special duty to ensure that the integrity of this age-old profession is preserved, protected, and upheld in the rigor of our practice. We must appreciate that our license to serve society is founded on trust that society places in us. Society expects us to serve its interests with utmost integrity and accountability. That is the basis on which we as accounting professionals earn and maintain our license to serve. We must continuously stand for trust, integrity and service. Therefore, we cannot allow accountancy to become complicit in its own corruption. We cannot allow accountancy to facilitate, enable or even turn a blind eye to malfeasance in the management of public money. Because when that happens, hopes and aspirations wither on the vine. Dreams turn to dust to dust. Sadly, in our country, we are no strangers to this slow process of fiscal and moral decay that can come about when dreams ultimately turn to dust. Just a few familiar examples involving members of our own profession will suffice to make the point. We have KPMG, one of the big four auditing firms who by their own admission failed on the basic purpose of auditing and neglected the concept of public interest. We have Ngongi, that black owned auditing firm whose leaders blatantly contravened the, le the legal prescripts relating to ownership of audit firms, 
leading to the demise of an otherwise great success story of transformation, racial and gender trans transformation in the profession. We have Steinhoff as an example, an international retailing company whose accountancy professionals who were playing different roles in that institution essentially failed to serve the public interest, leading to significant losses for shareholders who include individual investors as well as ordinary people through their retirement funds and other institutional investment vehicles. Taxpayers too lost a great deal of capital through what happened at Steinhoff. I refer to taxpayers in recognition of the fact that the Public Investments Corporation, the PIC, which invests on behalf of government employees, lost significant investment value as a result of the Steinhoff so-called accounting irregularities. As you know, the government employees pension fund is a defined benefit pension fund, meaning that if its assets cannot cover its liabilities, taxpayers will have to foot the bill as those liabilities become due and payable to retired civil servants. And then we have the State Capture Commission, which yes, has yet to conclude its report, but listening to the testimonies through the, the available uh, platforms, that commission has nonetheless provided us with more than enough evidence for concluding that the accounting profession was implicated. These are just a few examples that remain our national shame, and we will continue to live in the shadow of these transgressions for generations to come. And before we talk about what state capture has cost us in pride, progress, reputation, and economic stability, allow me to shine the light for a moment on brighter tidings. Now, as Prof Pageng alluded earlier this year, the World Bank released its 2021 Global Synthesis Report into the independent independence of Supreme Audit Institutions. And they did this looking at 118 nations, 118 across the globe. Truly independent size, says the report, can fulfill their mandate to reduce waste and abuse of public resources, allowing these to be better channeled into programs that benefit citizens. Now, there are 10 indicators of ind independence, including legal, financial, mandate, coverage, as well as operational dimensions. Countries are graded on a ranking from zero for low to 10 for very high. Only two countries out of all of those that were surveyed scored a perfect 10. The one was the Seychelles, and the other, of course, was ourselves, South Africa. This is an important affirmation of the independence of the Auditor General of South Africa as the Supreme Audit Institution, and we must celebrate it. However, I believe that it should not only be a source of celebration, rather, it serves as a call to action, a signal that there is still much work to be done, and that those of us that have decided to dedicate ourselves to the task of supporting democracy by serving in the AGSA, we will find no easy road be be before us. So we should not become victims of our own complacency, neither should we be victims of any fear. We should be courageous enough to make a meaningful contribution to honor our democracy. The American investor, Charlie Munger, once said that in a democracy, it takes a scandal to trigger reform. He had in mind at the time the spectacular collapse of the American energy giant Enron, whose bankruptcy in 2001 due to corporate accounting fraud cost its shareholders in excess of 74 billion US dollars. Just how much, we may wonder, has our own great national scandal cost us? It's hard to say with certainty, given the scale and the scope of the alleged state capture and its impact across different institutions over many years. But there is a figure that comes to us via the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, who commissioned a study by Stellenbosch University 
into the depth of corruption in South Africa. That figure is one and a half trillion rand lost to our country between 2014 and 2019. To put that number into perspective, this is money that could have funded the country's developmental imperatives. So clearly, state capture has a direct impact on the lives of ordinary South Africans. Often we think of the state as having been captured, but in truth, if you think about it, it's about you and I, the citizenry, each of us who has a stake in the future of this nation, whose hopes and dreams have effectively been held hostage. In the public service where we ordered, it is the failure to improve people's lives and the derailing of their democratic aspirations that bear the most eloquent testimony to the consequences of capture. Practically put, how many hospitals could have been built for that big amount of money? How many schools? How many housing projects? How many enterprises? How many jobs? Now we can't audit imaginary expenditure. What we can do is learn and reform. The Swedish author and investment advisor to government, um, Dad Detta, whom Prof Pagen referred to, he reminds us that proper accounting is necessary for politicians and public representatives to act in the long-term interests of their communities. Without the use of modern accounting and professional governance, he argues, we are at risk of allowing the largest wealth segment in the world, public assets, to be mismanaged with resources wasted, obligations hidden, and ultimately vulnerable to corruption. Addressing this shortcoming would be a first step to restoring trust in government and faith in democracy for the benefit of society as a whole. It is time, says Dag Decker, for accountants to share their dreary suits <clears throat> and glasses, the uniform of their Clark Kent alter egos, and act like real superheroes whose mission is to bring proper transparency to governments. Now, this vision of super accountants rushing to the rescue is an attractive one, but I guess it ignores the everyday reality that we've come to know only too well that accountants are only human. We all know the names of the trusted firms and the individuals, some of whose cases I, I referred to earlier on, with legacies stretching back hundreds of years that have seen their reputations compromised, their integrity questioned by the net of capture that has left them wriggling and reeling in the taint of alleged corruption. What is an accountant without accountability? How can an accountant best do their job without, if needs be, being held to account? Now, I raise these questions in recognition that we have noble aspirations as a profession, but we're also human. So how do we keep each other and ourselves accountable? And I raise these questions not to draw a divide between professionals or to draw a divide between different components of our profession, but I raise them in the hope that we can all work together with a common goal in mind to apply our expertise to the building of a better and more equitable society, to repair, to rekindle, and to reform. Perhaps we can begin by drawing inspiration from solutions that have been put into practice in other countries. The most challenging has been the issue of ensuring independence of the audit business by separating it from other parts of the business of professional firms, splitting consulting from auditing in simple terms. And this is to follow the, the UK example, just for instance. Here at home, we can look to the white paper that was issued by the South African Auditing Profession Trust Initiative. Now, this is a project led by the leaders of the local auditing profession to assist 
with the journey of restoring trust and integrity in the profession. The white paper that's been published contains several proposals aimed at strengthening the, account, the auditing profession. And these include ensuring independence of boards of professional services firms by including independent non-executive members on those boards, and also increasing the transparency on how firms operate and how they are governed. They're also expected, these boards, to implement and enforce clear, transparent policies that link partner and staff remuneration to auto quality. And along with this, they say that there should be clear scope of service restrictions for the audit practice to prevent conflict while allowing the skills of audit practitioners to be developed. Now, I acknowledge these are complex debates, but we've got to have them and we've got to arrive at the solutions that will allow us to reform. In addition, one of the other um, proposals from the white paper is that there should be clear reporting obligations to external stakeholders and disclosures in a regularly, regularly published transparency report by the firm. The white paper, paper further proposes that firms should establish an independent organization whose mission would be to en enhance investor, investor confidence and public trust by improving the quality, relevance, and integrity of financial reporting. Over and above the issues of governance, the white paper calls on us as professionals to be ethical, to live up to the key values and principles that are set out in our code of ethics. To remember that ours is to serve in the public interest rather than to focus purely on the narrow interest of us of our clients. Now, if you ask uh, an auditing 101 student about the code of ethics and about this particular principle of serving in the public interest, they'll talk about it boldly. I worry often that if you ask somebody of 20 years experience, it takes a great deal of conversation to bring them back to that principle that we were all taught when we were studying Auditing 101. In essence, the white paper serves as a timely and valuable reminder of the four simple words that must guide us in our work. Trust, integrity, service, and accountability. This, I believe, is the mantra that must inform our thinking as auditing professionals, as accountancy professionals, even more broadly. This is the code that must define our practice of our trade, our practice as professionals. And that's why at the AGSA, the Auditor General of South Africa, we are ever mindful of our mandate to serve the public interest, to act independently without fear or favor, favor and to continue to play our vital role in the accountability value chain. But we know too, that our beleaguered profession is greatly in need of reform, of renewal, of rebuilding, of revival. How can we do this? I would suggest that there are three ways. And these ways, I think, apply not only to accountants and auditors, not only to professional services firms, but to a great deal more institutions. The first is about entrenching capable leadership. The second is about building capable institutions and being deliberate and consistent about building capable institutions. And the third, and perhaps the most important, is to put in place a culture of consequence management of accountability for wrongdoing. Because that's how you're going to set about creating a culture where wrongdoing is not the norm, but rather the exception. So capable leadership, capable institutions, consequence management. And I would like to believe that we are a society that is capable of fixing things, that is capable of renewal, that is capable of greatness. I also believe that we're capable of recognizing our duty, public or private, to act responsibly and ethically in everything that we do. 
that we can leave behind us the era of self-enrichment and corruption, that we can begin again as one to serve the greater good. As for the National Audit Office, we've been empowered in law through the amended Public Audit Act that came into effect in 2019. The amendment introduced a concept of material irregularities, which was born out, the, out of the failure to address audit findings that were tabled year on year by the Auditor General. So this concept and this instrument that we've been given to raise material irregularities and to drive the journey of implementing appropriate consequences we see as an instrument to influence and enforce change. A change that society yearns for and a change that should influence better governance and better outcomes. It's not a system that's designed to be punitive. It's a system designed in the first instance to encourage accountability and good governance. These can only be achieved if the correct preventative controls or checks and balances are put in place to prevent losses, wastage, or any wrongdoing with public funds. These new powers do not empower the AG, as people often say, to take people to jail, but rather they, they empower the AG to enforce corrective actions where preventative controls have failed and where those that have been appointed as the stewards of public funds fail to effect consequences. It comes after the effect. The punitive part comes only after, and it does not replace the duty, the responsibility, and the opportunity of our accounting officers to act pro proactively to prevent problems and to deal with them as soon as they arise. So these new powers of the AG should not be feared. Rather, they should be embraced in the interest of supporting good governance. Professor Pakin, before I conclude, I would like to take an opportunity to reflect on what we as a profession need to do to follow the international standards and be part of the globalized change the profession is undergoing. We have to ensure that we conduct accountancy in the public interest, as I've said, because that must be the key driver to our work, whether we're working as accountants, as consultants, or as auditors. This means that the work we do must have regard for the interest of the users beyond our specific of, of the users beyond our specific clients. The work we do must be of high quality and it must respond to the needs and expectations of stakeholders. We live in a world where investment decisions are made and implemented quickly, right? And these, are, these decisions are, are made by people who use financial statements, people who rely on accountants and auditors to prepare and publish relevant and credible financial information. So our country's prosperity depends on our ability to build and maintain confidence and trust in the accounting and auditing profession. Never has it been more urgent to reaffirm our commitment to ethical conduct, to integrity, to quality, and to service. At the AGSA, we grapple with the matter of how we maintain our own independence, our relevance, and our professionalism on an ongoing basis. To this end, we keep finding ways to close the gap be it real or perceived, between our audit messages and the lived experiences of citizens. We place extreme emphasis on stakeholder management to influence better performance and accountability by the people appointed as stewards over public, public institutions. We continue to drive the professionalization of our office. In fact, through the SICA accredited training scheme that we have, which benefits over 1,200 young people in any given year, we make a significant contribution to the growth and transformation of the profession with benefits for both the public 
and the private sectors. We do not compromise on our extreme adherence to, to quality control measures, and we ensure that our staff undergo regular external assessments. We report on our performance transparently in our own annual report, taking the corrective steps we undertake where we did not meet our set high standards and benchmarks. As an organization, we strive to lead by example. We strive to ensure that year on year, we obtain clean audits from independent external auditors that scrutinize our books. And we also ensure that we adhere to the very same rules that we expect our auditees to adhere to. Now, this doesn't mean that as an institution, we don't have our own challenges, but at all times, we endeavor to do the right things, to live up to the spirit and the letter of our code and our mantra, that of trust, integrity, service, and accountability. We do this not just for the present moment, but for the future of our institution and our profession as we seek to encourage the very best and the brightest young, young graduates to join our graduate programs and share our vision and our work with us. I conclude by asking once again, Prof Hagen, that we find the human face inside the numbers, that we strive to live up to the ideals that guide and drive us as South Africans. Let us support and lift each other up, even when we hold each other to account. Let us find within ourselves the strength, the conscience, and the courage to serve the greater good. Here on this continent where humanity began, let us prove to the world that we are capable of doing what needs to be done to fulfill, fulfill our hopes to realize our dreams and to make this a better place for all of us. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Sakani, for that inspiring lecture. The comments are many. And as you can imagine, when someone like you gives the VCs lecture, what happens, the kinds of questions that we get, I would say, categorize them in, into three. There are questions that are about the lecture. There are questions that are about your career journey that come from uh, students, undergraduates and postgrads. And there are questions that are of personal interest. Um, people wanting to know what you have read or what keeps you going or stuff like that. It's all very interesting because this is the nature of the VC's lecture, people who inspire us. So, so I'm, what in ans asking the questions, I'm going to mix them. I'll start with one for the lecture, I'll go to the career one, I'll go to the personal one, uh, just so that we, we get a mix. Uh, but the, there's lots of questions and I hope we are able to get to all of them by the end of, 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 of our time. But also I noticed that I forgot to recognize my bosses, my uh, my boss, the chair of council, Ms. Baba Longonyama. Thank you so much for for attending uh, this VC's lecture. It means a lot. We know how busy you are, but you always make the time to be with us in this uh, environment. And of course, our chancellor. Uh, I don't know which part of the world our chancellor is, uh, but we are very delighted that we are with us again. She's very busy going all over the place, all over the world meeting and, and, and making things happen. And we're delighted that you always make an effort not only to support us, but to be with us. Thank you so much for both of you being here and all other members of council who may be in the audience. So kind of my the first question, and I'll indicate where it comes from if the, the name is mentioned. If the name is not mentioned, it's anonymous. The first question says, uh, how does the Auditor General ensure the safety of their auditors and the integrity of their audits when they discover corruption or fraud? And as a result, there is a reactionary threat to the Auditor General's processes and people. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, in fact, we worry 
all the time about the threats to the staff of the, the National Audit Office. Um, I'm always quite clear that the, the young professionals that choose to work in the audit office, these are people who studied accountancy and auditing. They, they don't, don't sign up to, to be threatened in that way. But the good thing is they, they prove to be resilient because they understand the mission that we are charged to do to deal with. So how do we deal with it? In a couple of ways. One, we collaborate with, with SAPs and other leaders in, in the institutions where we audit to um, identify risks, to mitigate risks proactively and also to, to safeguard people where we need to. Um, and that seems to have worked so far. Um, the second thing we do is we equip our guys with with three things. One is just vigilance around you. And I think that's a, that's something that all of us in South Africa need to learn. Um, the second thing is to make sure that they don't keep any information to themselves. So when you audit, you audit in a team and make sure that any finding is known by everybody else around you. Uh, that way, you know, it's quite difficult for anybody to pinpoint uh, an individual and, and push them back. The third thing is we keep re reminding our guys that our job is to audit and report and to hand over the issues to those that must drive the, the implementation of consequences. Um, it, we only step in when the, the people who need to implement consequences fail to do so. So I've given a long answer. I'm saying we still worry about it, um, but so far uh, we've had few incidents and those few cause us to continue to worry. Uh, and and the, the, the other part of my answer is that we continue to collaborate with um, other institutions that help to keep our team safe. All right. Thank you, Takani. I'm going to go to the, I want to go to a career question. Um, uh, right, right, right. A career question uh, is from Sarah uh, Amot. And Sarah says, how did Ms. Maluleke decide or know that public accounting was for her and she was making the right choice? Or did she have to kiss a few ugly career frogs before she realized what she wanted to do? And this question comes from a final year undergraduate student. Uh, so when I finished my final year, I had no clue that this is what I would be doing one day. Um, you would have heard from Prof. Pagain's introduction that I wanted to be a lawyer and then I switched. And I switched because somebody told me I couldn't do it. So that was why I became an accountant. So I didn't have any aspirations of being an accountant when I started at university. When I finished at university, I wanted to be an accountant and I was clear about why. But what I would do with it exactly, I wasn't 100% sure. All I knew is that I would find opportunities to serve because that's what makes me tick. And through my journey, I've done different things, um, not all of them frogs, um, and all of them have equipped me to bring this moment about where I feel confident of my ability to execute on this set of responsibilities. So, Ma, Sarah, I, I don't think uh, we should give in to any anxiety at, at, the, at the space where you are. Uh, if you don't know, it's okay. Just keep doing the right things. Um, try different things, work hard at them, be vigilant and diligent in doing your work um, and maintain your integrity and reputation and you'll be fine. Um, you know, when people ask you, what will you do in five years? I often find that question most unhelpful because very few of us know what we'll be doing in five years. And the world has told us, has taught us that things change very quickly. So my advice, is, advice to you is um, follow your heart, do the things that resonate with your values. Um, don't chase money, money will find you. Do things that really inspire you uh, and work hard at them uh, and maintain your reputation and professionalism at all times. Thanks, Sakane. Uh, Professor Philip Dijaka is asking um, a few provocative questions or, or this one. I like this one because uh, uh, I always wonder. And he says, um, does South Africa still need thousands of bright students to become accountants? I get a few more who, whose talents and personalities lead to accountancy as career. But should most not focus on the fourth industrial revolution skills with integrity, of course. 
you know, I think time will tell what happens with the accountancy profession. I believe that it's never been more urgent for us to create accountants that are able to learn and keep changing uh, while still maintaining the grounding in our technical abilities, but also in our code of ethics, because that's the brand. That's what people trust. And then you can go and do all sorts of other things. So um, I think accountancy provides a wonderful grounding. Um, and I think it's a it's a profession that we need to maintain strength in if we are to have the ability to uh, attract capital, retain capital, make sure that capital is deployed in the best way possible, regardless of the specific roles we're playing. So I, I still think we, we can do with a few more accountants as long as they subscribe to the key principles of service, of integrity, um, and, and of, of serving the public interest. Uh, thank you, Sakani. Uh, there's a career question that, um, and it comes from Skumbuzo Bulose, and Skumbuzo says, um, where does the Auditor General, Ms. Sakani Maluleke, see herself after finishing her full term? Is she going to do the private sector or continue working in government? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure what I'll be doing in, in seven years' time. So my tenure is a seven-year one. Um, so I've got six and a bit years left. Um, I, I'll see. I'm going to figure it out. I'll, I'll do things that inspire me things that resonate with my values and whom I seek to be in the world. Um, whether it's private sector or public sector, we'll see. Uh, interestingly, one of the rules that apply to the Auditor General, which I think as, as South Africans we ought to know and value, is that to preserve the real and perceived independence of the person that sits as the Auditor General, um, they're not allowed to go and, and work in the public sector immediately after leaving office. Um, so that you never think that maybe the AG stopped giving bad reports because she wants a job somewhere. Or you never think that she's giving really glowing report uh, in a way that's dishonest. Um, even if she isn't, but just the perception alone would be would be a taint on the institution. So, so I would likely stay away from, from the public sector directly, but what I will do, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Just to follow up on your comment now, someone asked, municipalities are hammered consistently for use of consultants. Majority of these consultants are former Auditor General officials and AXA co-sourced firms. They audit municipalities with self-interest. Audit opinion released uh, on the 30th of November, okay, I don't know. Uh, the audit opinion released in 30th November, come 7th January, the same auditor knocks on the municipalities, municipal doors, enticing municipal officials and council with the dream of clean, of a clean audit through his AXA experience and privileged audit client knowledge obtained through the audit. The AXA co-sourced audit firms are far worse is it possible to have a restraint of trade on these officials? You're quite right. Any, any indication that people act unethically is something we must push back on, whether it's people that we've employed or people that we have worked with and that we've co-sourced their work. Um, we have a re restraint of trade in terms of the people we hire. So, so when our guys leave a particular audit, um, they, they can't go and join that institution immediately. And that restraint is consistent with what applies in the private sector audit firms as well. Uh, so, so that doesn't happen in terms of somebody leaving immediately to go join that audit where they were involved, uh, because we, we do believe that it's important to maintain the independence, real and perceived, right? Um, so on the coal sourced audit firms, I'm not aware that our, our firms do that, but if they do, please do let us know so that we can push back on it because it does fall foul of the principles around independence and integrity that we all espouse as, as professionals. Thank you, Sakani. I want to go to a career question. And, um, and uh, here's a question from uh, B Mklambi, and it says, we often hear that the journey to the title CASA is different from all those, for all those who embark on it. 
May you please share with us your journey from undergrad to where you are today. I'm going to ask you to summarize it. Um, <laughs> I guess Sambi is, is looking at, um, you know, it seems to me that, that students are worried about this journey. Is this the right one? How does it go about? Yeah. Look, the, the journey towards qualifying as a CA is still well worth it. Um, the qualification opens many doors for, for, for people who hold that designation to do different things um, and to kind of explore as young professionals until they find the sweet spot in terms of what it is they really want to do in the world. And my journey has been similar. I found that um, having qualified as a CA, having completed my, my academics at UCT, done my articles, and, um, and, and uh, I was able to, and completed my board exams, I was able to try different things. And I, I, I always value the designation for that benefit. Um, and so for, for, for people who are contemplating whether or not it's worth it, my experience tells me that it is worth it. And I've stayed close enough to the profession to, to still see that it is well worth it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful foundation to go and do all sorts of things. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, lots of questions here, Takane. We can, we can stay here for the whole night. Uh, very interesting questions. I want to go up there. And this one um, is from, uh, from, and when I, if I don't understand the, the acronyms that you use, Takane, I'm just gonna, just refer to, to them as they are because some people are using that. Kaone, Kaone M says, rampant corruption and poor governance is very common across Africa. And I can imagine can lead to demotivation for those that are doing their best in the public sector, especially in the Auditor General Office. What keeps you going and what motivates you to do your job with the utmost integrity, efficiency, accountability as we see you do since you have stepped into your role. Also, what has been your proudest moment in your career? I should have said this is a career question, but go ahead. OK, no, thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for the compliment um, and the recognition. Um, the thing that keeps me going is, is the notion that I feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm caused to do in this world. I didn't know. 20 years ago, I had no clue at the Auditor General, um, but where I am now feels like the right thing to do. So that's why I'm able to wake up every morning and give it my all. Um, and I will continue to do that until I, I complete this term because that's what I committed to South Africans. Um, and, and beyond that, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> all right. And Petro Lekanyani says, how does the Auditor General's office build public confidence when some municipalities perennially get clean audits while bread and butter issues such as water, housing, primary health care, connectivity, etc., aren't even the desired levels. To a lay person like me, these contrasting outcomes can lead to, to high levels of apathy in the Auditor General's office involvement in strengthening our democracy. Yeah, I think that's a great question and it's something we grapple with all the time. I often say that if you look at what a clean audit means, it means that that municipality, as was the example, that they've been able to prepare financials that are credible. So you actually know where the money went, right? So you can assess whether it was a good thing that that money went there, but at least you know what they've done with it, which has been important. It's the first tier um, of accountability and transparency. We also check about check and performance information. We look at the credibility of that information whether or not they've actually achieved what they say they have. It then gives you a tool to assess whether or not that's enough to meet your aspiration, whether or not that's consistent with your expectations. And if it's not, you can have a conversation. If they can't even give you a performance report that's credible, you can't have that conversation, right? The third part is about compliance with key laws and regulations. So for me, a clean audit tells you about an institution that has the right level of commitment to accountability and to transparency. What we need to do then is to use that information to have the next conversation about performance, actual performance. So, so it's not either or, it's both, 
it's clean audit and um, delivery. It's clean audit and institutional strength. Um, and so when we grapple with it in the audit office, we keep asking ourselves, are, are we doing enough to close the gap in perception between what a clean audit can mean and should mean and what people think it means? Some of the gap is about making sure people understand, but also some of the gap is about us shifting how we look at things so that we can meet the reasonable expectations of citizens. So it doesn't lead to apathy. When you ask these questions, it challenges us to keep doing better and better. All right. And the, the next question says, can Mema Luleke unpack for us on how stakeholder engagement managers in her office can assist in realizing the goals of the country and the mandate of the office? And secondly, is the amended PAA implementable by the relevant stakeholders to hold those in wrong in the wrong accountable. So let me start with the stakeholder manager. So in fact, most of our auditors actually are stakeholder managers. When we audit, we we engage on an ongoing basis with the people responsible for running those institutions. Uh, we dedicate a lot of our resources, a lot of our time to engaging. We talk about um, the status of records even before the audit starts to make sure that they are ready, right? Um, we talk to them about the audit outcomes um, and what they mean and how they can fix things. Um, and, and we talk to them about what are the things they need to change in their institutions to drive improvement. So that's, and, and that's a duty that falls upon pretty much all of our auditors um, in, in a way that challenges them but excites them at the same time. Um, we believe that We've got to use the fact that we understand the public sector in the way that we do. We see the public sector right across the different value chains every single year. So we're constantly there. We've got to use that information to the benefit of those that are charged with running government. Um, in fact, that's consistent with international standards, actually, applying to supreme audit institutions. The idea that supreme audit institutions ought not to just report and audit, or pardon me, audit and report. They've actually got to use the fact that they have the audit mandate to mine insights that can help those that run government understand what actions to take so that they can drive improvements. So, so, and we, so we've embraced that as a principle and have done so for many years and will continue to do it. Hopefully in time, the work we'll do will start to drive a different culture, start to change behaviors in the public sector uh, and make sure that we equip those accounting officers and senior managers with an understanding of how our audit insights can help them rather than to for it to be a source of anxiety and fear, right? Um, and similarly with the, with the Public Audit Act, the, the, the instrument allows us to enforce consequences. So the way it works is this way. It says, once you've audited um, and you find a non-compliance, let's say, or a problem, you report it to the accounting officer. So that's the MM, that's the head of department, um, that's the director general. And the, the law actually says that they must take the issue, go and investigate what really happened, take the action of either disciplining staff, training staff, uh, so that the matter doesn't arise again, tightening their system so that the, the error doesn't arise, um, or if there's been a leakage of funds, go and collect those funds back into the institutions, recover them, uh, and if there's been criminality, refer the matter for, for investigation by uh, an action by law enforcement. That's what the law says. The problem is that far too many of them don't do that. So this new amendment equips us with the responsibility and the duty and then the right to enforce the, the implementation of consequences. So we elevate the, the requirement of the accounting officer to act. Can it help? Absolutely. Are we seeing it help? Yes, we are. Must we do more? Absolutely, I believe so. You know, last time we talked about the, the, the audit outcomes for provincial and national government, I kept giving an example <clears throat> of a particular auditee in the Eastern Cape where because they failed to safeguard a grader, okay? So, so and this grader was stolen because it was left with the keys inside and it wasn't put in, in a safe in safe storage overnight. 
and then this thing was driven across the border. Um, so we raised the material irregularity and said, accounting officer, go and recover this thing. It's now urgent because you're losing public funds, and worse still, this asset should actually be driving the delivery of services to citizens, and now it's not there. So what happened? The matter was reported to SAPS. The trap tower, the grader was, was actually brought back, so the grader is back. Mm. I suspect that had we not implemented these powers, we would have had this report of ours that then gets ignored, sits on a shelf somewhere, and then the, the accounting officer continues with other things, right, during the course of the year. And by the time we come back a year later, there's no hope of finding the data. So at least we are seeing that level of impact. In some instances, it's really about issues where we can refer matters to law enforcement, or there is recovery of funds that are being lost. So it certainly can work. We're starting to see green shoots on it, uh, but we have to do more, and I know this. As someone asks, I mean, with all of that, are you not worried that your office may be attacked in the same manner that the public protector was due to shaking up big trees? I mean, you have the power to ultimately make officials who have caused the state financial losses to pay back the money. You know, if, if that happens, if, if we, so, so I've embraced this idea that the better we do our work, the less popular we'll be. That's the paradox of the thing. <laughs> and I think we, we, we've embraced that and we've embraced it in the sense that we understand the mandate we've been given and, and we, we respect it and we will continue to, to do that work without any fear or favor. If that happens, I would hope that South Africans would be the very first people to push back. I would hope that those whom the audit office is meant to serve would be the very first ones to ensure that our staff is not threatened, um, the institution is not put under pressure. Because it's really not about personalities, right? It's about institutions fulfilling their given mandate for the benefit of citizens. And we've got to make sure that that happens. I want to ask the last three questions because I can see that time is running out. We, we're going to have to leave a lot of questions unanswered. Uh, and I hope people forgive us for that. Um, I can't even put it on you that um, you should answer them in your in your private time. But uh, but but let's let let me ask this one. Um, and uh, this one is about uh, I am a CSM practitioner in a very junior role, working for an organ of state, and I'm also. I don't know why my, my thing keeps running out of whatever. And I'm also a final year auditing student. The leaking of the fiscus happens mainly through weak controls in the SCM environment. I would like to know from Ms. Maluleke if she has considered interviewing CSM practitioners who are at the call phase in an effort to strengthen audit outcomes and so that she can have a clear understanding of ethical behaviors, especially in, the, in public institutions. My second question is how can a person like myself being an SEM practitioner and an audit professional be a resource in the fight against corruption and malfeasance? Lastly, does she think CFOs need to have a clear understanding of SCM? Sorry, I should have said SCM, I've been saying CSM. As, <laughs> do CFOs have to have a clear understanding of SCM processes or to be trained in SEM, especially in public institutions? Mm -hmm. No, thank you for those questions. Um, it's wonderful to come across a professional that's passionate about their work in, in the area of supply chain management. Um, the first question about um, should we or could we or do we interact with, with um, SEM practitioners? In fact, we do in three ways. The first one is really at the audit phase. So what we do is when we have audit findings, we talk to the senior managers, including the SEM manager, around the type of find findings we are, we are arriving at, the preventative controls that need to be put in place or strengthened so that the leakage doesn't continue. Um, and then the second thing we do is we, we talk to, to the accounting officer, they're the boss of the SEM practitioners, um, a great deal about their responsibilities and how they can ensure that a combination of the work done by the SEM practitioner, the work done by the internal auditors, 
actually support that accounting officer in fulfilling their responsibility. You know, the, the PFMA, the Public Finance Management Act, as well as the management, the, the Municipal Finance Management Act, they place a huge responsibility on accounting officers to design, implement, and maintain effective controls. And so we work closely with those accounting officers in sharing our insights on what could they put in place, how is it going? What do what do our audits tell us is a problem, and how they can go about fixing it? And we continue with with that guidance and conversation. The the other part of how we engage with, with SEM practitioners is that there are different fora uh, in 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 the public sector for public for for SEM practitioners. So we we often get invited to talk to them uh, about different things. So perhaps what 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 I'm hearing you say is we ought to do more of that. CFOs needs to know about the controls at supply chain management. They don't need to have the expertise of supply chain management. That's why we always call upon professionals managing supply chain. Um, so, so, so that you, you can't put the duty on the CFO to know um, financial accounting, auditing, and understand uh, ACM. Often institutions are too big um, and too complex to, to, to put that onerous responsibility on one person. Sometimes it can work, but in most instances it doesn't work. Um, and how could you be a resource? I think share knowledge, create networks, share knowledge, share, share your experiences, and also learn from others so that you can contribute in your own environment, but also help others learn from your experiences as well. Thanks, Satan. I said three questions, but actually these are my last three questions. They are all career, personal interest, and so on. And the first one is uh, the first last one is from Yolanda Isaacs, and she says, "How can how can we teach or equip non-financial people, such as counselors, in terms of the implications on wasteful expenditure?" Can you say that again. How, how can we teach non-financial people, such as counselors, in terms of the implications on wasteful expenditure? You know, the matters around those duties of counselors um, for me it's really about the induction program make sure that you've got um, a proper induction program that equips the elected public representatives to understand their duties and figure out how, how they execute on them and then you've got to drive ongoing training for for, for those for those accountants uh, for for those for those counselors uh, because it's one thing to do one um, uh, induction program at the beginning of term and then forget about it. You've got to do it on a consistent basis. The other thing is we've got to find a way to maintain stability in leadership. So you need competence and you need stability because that's how you build capability in an institution. So when you've got such quick turnover, it just doesn't, you struggle to build capability uh, and institutional strength. Thank you. And one from Philip Dijacha, and, and he says, thank you for raising accountability as an idea. Have you read the book, The Reckoning by Jacob Saul? No, I haven't. I take it I should. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering whether Philip Dijacha taught you or he came after you left? Oh, about well, uh, 20 years. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Who knows? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> there's a there's another question. This is the last one, Sakani, that I'm asking in the midst of so many that I cannot ask because of time. Uh, and it says, and it's from Yolanda again. Thank you so much, Yolanda, for the interesting questions. And Yolanda says, when you leave office one day, what legacy do you want to leave behind? I would want to be remembered for having protected the strong institution that I inherited, for having shifted the needle in delivering value to society. And that's why I keep talking about how I want our work to have a more direct link to the lived experiences of South Africans. Yes, in demonstrating it, but also in improving it. Whilst we don't run government, I would want to make sure that the fact that we are there makes a difference in different institutions. That's what I would like. 
Thank you so much. We are at the end of our program, and so we have to conclude this important discussion. But as I said, there are so many questions and um, that have been asked, all of them very interesting. I mean, I, 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 I think it would be a good idea to take the questions, hand them over to the Commerce Students Council so that they can invite you and you can have a conversation with them just on those questions because there are kinds of questions that I think uh, uh, students in the Faculty of Commerce would really benefit from an engagement with. And I know that they've invited you before and I hope they keep inviting you every year so that by the time you leave office, they have gained as much as, as, as possible from you. But Sakane, thank you for sharing your insights. You have given us important food for thought about the role that we as a university have to play in opening the way to a future workforce of accountants that truly reflects the demographics of South Africa and which will ultimately contribute to strengthening our democracy. You have also responded to important career questions that our students have. You have served as an inspiration. You have shared not only your knowledge, you've shared yourself with us tonight, and that's incredibly valuable. I also thank my colleagues in the communications and marketing department as well as Information and Communi Communication Technology Services at UCT for organizing and managing this event. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you for joining us this evening and contributing to the discussion with your thoughtful questions and comments. I can see that many of you are still online, even though we are over time, and I really, really appreciate your generosity. And Sakani is credit to you because uh, if it's not uh, instructive, people just log out. So thank you very much, colleagues, friends, and everyone else who joined us. Have a good evening. Thank you very much, Prof Paking and the UCT community. Have a good evening, everybody.